Okay, uh, thanks very much to Tony and the other uh, workshop organizers um, for putting this together. Thanks uh, for inviting me to participate. Uh, as Tony mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, some embodied approaches to Evo Devo, and I'm going to focus on develop a specific aspect of the development, which is morphological change. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk today about this idea of Evo Devo Soro, and I will unpack this uh, this term as we go. So um, let me start with SORO or soft uh, robotics. This is a burgeoning uh, field within the greater field uh, of robotics. This is just a small sampling of some of the interesting uh, zoo of creatures that are starting to be reported uh, in the soft robotics uh, literature. A lot of physical uh, designs, a lot of physical uh, robots that are out there. But I think that the, the engineering and manufacturing challenges uh, of this field are running ahead of our ability to design them. So I'm coming at this from the point of view of a roboticist. We have these very non-intuitive systems. How do we go about designing them? Uh, I'm going to show you the application of evolutionary algorithms to do so, and also why we might want to include Devo to help us better design these uh, soft robots. So I'm going to uh, touch on a couple of projects uh, today. The first one I'm going to start on is some work by my PhD student, Sam Kriegman. Um, this is very recent work. He just presented this at the Gecko conference uh, last week. This was uh, Sam's attempt to build a minimal Evo Devo model on top of uh, soft robotics. So let me sort of work my way up from the bottom. Let's start with uh, Soro. So, uh, Soro here, we're going to start by simulating soft robots. We're here using the VoxCAD simulation package that was developed in Hot Lipson's group. Um, you can Google VoxCAD and find a copy and download it and try it out yourself. Um, as you can see here, uh, VoxCAD approaches the simulation of soft robots using a finite element method where we approximate any physical soft robot as a collection of these 3D pixels uh, or voxels. Um, we can use an evolutionary algorithm or any other optimization system to place voxels, so to set the shape of the robot, to set the material properties, to embed a controller inside that robot, uh, whatever you like. In this case, we're starting with about as simple a controller as you can imagine. Again, this is an attempt to try and create a minimal Evo Devo system. We have an open loop controller, which is simply changing the resting volumes of all of these voxels. So if you want, you can think of any one of these simulated voxels as being a hollow, and we can increase or decrease the air pressure inside to reduce or increase the volume of that that voxel. So we have a very, very simple controller. And then on top of that, we're going to add uh, development. And in this case, again, trying to keep things simple, we have a developmental model which is slowly changing the resting volume of each voxel. So we have a resting volume. Um, we're setting, slowly changing the air pressure, if you like, inside of these voxels. And by doing so, we're deforming the shape of this relatively simple robot, which in this case is just a three by three by four uh, robot. So we have these two time scales now. We have the fast time scale, which is the controller, which is oscillating the volume of these voxels around a resting volume. And then we have a developmental trajectory, which is changing the resting volume over time. And when you put these two time scales together, you get things like this. So this is the same robot with those two uh, temporal patterns that I just showed you put together. And if you watch carefully, you'll notice that this robot slows up and speeds, uh, slows up, uh, speeds up and slows down uh, over time. So we get non-monotonic change in the velocity of these robots. So if you think about the velocity of its movement over time, it's getting a little bit faster and slower. And if we go back and look at the developmental and the control time scales, these are monotonic in terms of velocity. So we have a constant oscillation, and we also have a constant change in the resting volume of these, uh, of these voxels. So by putting these two time scales together, we get we get positive and negative interference between these temporal dynamics that are occurring at different scales. So Tony just mentioned this idea of heterochrony. So this is heterochrony in action here. We have these different temporal time scales interacting. So positive interference means 
these two changes come together and speed up the robot. Negative interference, they antagonize one another and the robot slows down. What's interesting is it speeds up and slows down several times over its lifetime. And again, as Tony just mentioned, one of our goals in uh, evolutionary algorithms is to make sure that there's rich material for evolution to act on. So with these two relatively simple processes, we already have some rich material that with the right evolutionary algorithm, it will be able to exploit that richness. And I'm going to show you how evolution actually does that. Okay, so I've shown you SORO, or the controller underneath of the soft robots. Devo now let's uh, add Evo on top, where we've got three time scales going now. We have a population of these robots. Each one has its own developmental trajectory, and these different de developmental trajectories cause them to speed up and slow down, but over their lifetime, some of these robots move a little bit faster than others. So you can imagine what we do at this point. Uh, we delete the robots that move a little bit slower. We select the surviving robots. We copy them and we introduce random changes whenever we make a copy, and those mutants replace the recently vacated slots of the slower robots and rinse and repeat. So that's Evo, Devo, Soro. So far, so good? Okay, so that's sort of the intuition behind it. I'm going to sort of dig down now into a little bit of the details. So what's actually going on under the hood? I mentioned that these, uh, the, this very simple robot you see is made up of a 4 by 4 by 3 collection of 48 voxels. We created a control treatment where we took Devo out. So obviously we call this just Evo. And in the Evo case, we're going to evolve populations of robots where each genome is encoding 48 evolvable parameters, which is the fixed resting volume of uh, each voxel. So uh, VK0 represents the resting volume of the kth uh, voxel. And then remember that the controller is oscillating the volume of that voxel around that VK0. So each of the 48 voxels has its own resting volume. That's Evo. We're going to evolve those 48 parameters. We did 30 independent evolutionary simulations of this control treatment and an additional 30 runs of our experimental treatment, which is Evo Devo. So in Evo Devo, we have twice the evolvable parameters because each voxel has its initial resting volume, VK0, and it is gradually changing its resting volume to VK1, which is its final resting volume. So this little, uh, this little figure on the right is showing one voxel, which is gradually becoming larger over time, but evolution is able to change VK0 and VK1 in each of the 48 voxels. So some voxels may evolve to become smaller over the lifetime of the robot or larger. So far, so good. Two evolutionary systems. Obviously, the second one has more evolvable parameters. We tried to normalize the mutation rate between these. We tried to make sure that all other aspects of these two evolutionary simulations were as close as possible. So we were comparing apples to apples. And not surprisingly, I wouldn't be here talking about this if this didn't work. Um, if you look carefully, you'll notice that in the first uh, 20, 30, 40 generations, which is plotted on the horizontal axis here, Evo Devo is actually doing worse than Evo um, for several reasons. As I just mentioned, there are twice the number of parameters that evolution needs to optimize. And also, because in the Evo Devo case, the robot is slowly deforming its shape over time, that is disrupting in many cases this clean oscillation being produced by the underlying controller. So in robotics and in biology, development usually comes with a cost. In this case, the cost is that this slow change, if it's not the right kind of development, can actually disrupt this movement. This is the negative interference. But it doesn't take long for Evo Devo to gradually outperform Evo. The question then is, why is Evo do Devo doing better? Uh, Tony mentioned a few hypotheses for why that might be uh, the case. So let me uh, show you some of the analysis we've done on this so far. The first one has to do with uh, mutational impact. So what you're, wa what you're looking at on the left, and I apologize for the light in here, hopefully you can see it okay. We look to see what was the impact on behavior of a mutation. 
So across those 30 evolutionary runs, we took every single robot that produced at least one child, and we measured the fitness of the parent and the fitness of the child, and fitness is just the distance that the robot uh, traveled. You'll notice um, in the lower left of this panel that most of the, uh, most of the parent fitnesses are between 0 and 15, and almost all of the children produced from those parents had a fitness of 0. So most of the mutations that occurred in the EVO case were catastrophic and deleterious. So there's definitely no hopeful monsters or very, very few of them in the EVO case. Things look very different in the DEVO case, and I apologize again for the lighting. Um, there is a little bit of mass in this 2D histogram uh, down here. So again, we took all of the parents that produced children in the EVO DEVO case, we measured their fitness, and we measured the fitness of the children, and we can see that there are quite a few uh, non-hopeful monsters down here, a lot of catastrophic and deleterious mutations. But we do see that there is a fair bit of weight in this 2D histogram along the diagonal. And so the weight on the diagonal here represents children that had fitnesses that were very close to their parents. You would expect that towards the lower left of this diagonal, but way up towards the upper right, this was quite surprising. So in the upper right, we have parents that are already highly optimized. They're traveling quite quickly. And mutations produce children that move maybe slightly slower, about the same speed, or maybe even slightly faster than the parents. So mutation, there are many more mutations here that are beneficial when we have EVO-DEVO, and beneficial even when we have a highly optimized uh, phenotype. And this is something that we're obviously looking for in evolutionary computation. So this is part of the reason why we would want to include development in our robotics experiments. If we want to try and automatically design body and brain of our robots. We want to make sure that our evolutionary process is producing hopeful monsters, or at least is able to make improvement on already highly fit uh, machines. Okay. So um, how is EvoDevo able to actually do this? Well, again, it comes back to these temporal dynamics. So let's go back to the control case for a moment. Imagine we have a parent, and in that parent robot, there is one voxel, the K of voxel, that's oscillating around this particular value of VK0. Imagine that this parent produces a child, and a mutation falls inside this, this K of voxel and changes the resting volume of this voxel from that to that. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Nothing on the surface, but if you look carefully, you'll notice that VK0, or the resting volume of this voxel in the child, is already different in the first time step of the child's lifetime. So this mutation has already affected the phenotype, and is therefore going to affect behavior the moment that child starts moving. If we turn to Evo Devo now, and we imagine a parent robot, and inside that parent robot is one voxel that has these values of VK0 and VK1, a mutation falls inside of this Kth voxel and changes VK1, for example, and I apologize for my PowerPoint uh, artistry here, but I think you get the idea. VK1 changes, but in the child, at least for the few, first few time steps of this child's lifetime, it is going to move exactly the same as the parent. It's going to start to diverge over its lifetime, but we have something here like a heterochronic mutation or a late onset mutation where the behavioral impact of that mutation isn't kicking in until later in the lifetime of this child robot. Again, why do these late onset mutations matter? Well, if our fitness is how far the robot moves over its lifetime and mutational impact is kicking in later, then by definition, the magnitude of behavioral impact is probably going to be less, right? We're only changing the behavior of this robot partway through its lifetime. If the mutational magnitude is left is less, so if you look at the area between the orange curves and the area between the blue curves, generally the area between the orange curves is less. If the behavioral impact is less in the EVO-DEVO mutations than in EVO, Ronald Fisher told us back in the 1930s that mutations that have small 
behavioral impacts are more likely to be beneficial. Right? So in essence, by introducing Devo, we're giving Evo a palette or a continuum of mutations, some of which have large behavioral impacts and some of which have small behavioral impacts, which overall increases the evolvability of our system. So that's one of the benefits of Devo for us as uh, roboticists. Okay, um, here's another view on those 30 Evo Devo uh, runs that we performed. Each panel represents one of the 30 runs. The horizontal axis in each panel is evolutionary time uh, as measured by generations. And the vertical axis in each panel is reporting what my student called the developmental window. But you can just think about this as the total amount of morphological change that one robot undergoes over its lifetime. So let me just give you an example here. Um, in this particular run, we had this robot, and if you watch carefully, um, its Devo program is deforming its body quite a bit. And again, we see this non-monotonic behavior. We see this robot speeding up and slowing down as it takes on these different uh, forms. This robot appeared in this particular population about halfway through evolutionary time. And over many more generations, this robot eventually produced this offspring. And if you look at the offspring, there is very little Devo at all. So it is basically maintaining the same morphological form over its lifetime. So what evolution has basically done, and I'm anthropomorphizing evolution here, has found this particular form that appears intermittently in the ancestor and has introduced a number of mutations which has broadened or genetically assimilated that particular morphological form so it maintains it over its lifetime. So again, this is an example of something Tony pointed out, which is the Baldwin effect. So in essence, evolution is combing Devo out of uh, the genotype after it's found the needle in the haystack, the particular body plan that produces the desired behavior. Um, if you've ever combined Evo and Devo or Evo and learning in a computational system, you tend to see this sort of pattern of this Baldwin effect. I wanted to show this slide because this is something that at least I haven't seen reported in the literature before, which is in a lot of these evolutionary runs, there was an actual increase in the amount of Devo before a subsequent decrease in the amount of Evo. So um, the most obvious hypothesis is that there's some sort of selection pressure to broaden Devo or allow an individual robot to search, quote unquote, a large number of body plans before hitting on one that really speeds up the robot, which then becomes genetically uh, assimilated. So that's, again, something that we're just hypothesizing, and it would be interesting to look into this in a little more uh, detail. Okay, so that's a very minimal model of Evo Devo, but hopefully it's useful to demonstrate why as roboticists we might want to include uh, aspects of development in our uh, systems. I'm going to switch gears now um, to a project that was conducted back in 2013 uh, by Nick Cheney, uh, who was working at the time in Hod Lipson's group. Um, Nick was also using VoxCAD and adapted uh, Ken's HyperNeat algorithm. I won't steal Ken's thunder, so I'm not going to talk about HyperNeat too much today. Let me just uh, tell you a little bit about what it does, and Ken, correct me if I uh, misspeak. Um, HyperNeat biases evolution towards regular patterns, symmetry, repetition, the kinds of things you see in developing uh, organisms, which are also useful in uh, robots. So what Nick did was to take uh, HyperNeat, this evolutionary algorithm, and the genotype is known as a CPPN. And again, I'll let Ken talk about it. The genotype is on the left there. What the genotype is in essence doing is painting regular patterns inside this empty cage you see on the right. So genotype on the left, phenotype on the right. Uh, Nick set up his evolutionary algorithm so that the genotype can place voxels inside this empty cage. So unlike the project I just showed you, in this case, evolution can actually dictate the three-dimensional shape. The color of the voxels represent material properties of those voxels. So the genotype is not only constructing the 3D shape of the robot, but also painting different material properties onto those voxels. 
It's easier to explain this if you watch the video. Um, so what you're watching now are snapshots from one evolutionary run, and you, you're watching the best robot in the population at each moment. Red voxels are muscle. Again, they oscillate at a fixed frequency. Green voxels are also muscle, but they oscillate in antiphase. So you can think of these as agonist and antagonistic muscle groups, uh, if you like. Uh, you might catch a glimpse of some light blue voxels, which is soft, passive structure. So this is something like fat. Um, and the dark blue voxels represent passive, stiff material, which is the analog of bone. So you can see here the hyperneat evolutionary algorithm uh, discovering robots with different shape and different material uh, properties. And we get faster and faster robots over evolutionary time. This was, the first, this was the first Evo Soro paper, the evolution of soft robots. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to start there. Um, recently, Nick has been working with myself uh, and Hod Lipson on really investigating how to do this well. Turns out, unfortunately, that it often doesn't work very well, and here's a, an example of it not working so well. Again, we have evolutionary time on the horizontal axis, Vertical axis is showing fitness, which is just the distance that the robot travels. Each individual pixel here represents a robot. And a single colored line represents uh, a species. So we can see that uh, there are a number of species operating inside now, not this population, but this ecosystem, if you like. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, after just a dozen generations or so, evolution tends to run out of gas. Um, even with 6,000 more generations, evolution is not able to find anything better than it did after about 100 generations or so. Um, the dirty little secret in our field is if you do try and evolve morphology along with control, often your evolutionary runs end up like this. It's very difficult to co-evolve morphology along with control. So Nick tackled this problem, and I wanted to show this today because we're pretty excited about these recent results, and I'll tell you how he managed to do this. He made some changes to this evolutionary algorithm which approximate development, and Nick's been able to achieve uh, at least one aspect of something we've been looking for in the field of evolutionary computation a long time, for a long time, which is this idea of open-ended evolution. The dream of using a genetic algorithm is that if we just keep throwing more computational effort at it, it will continue to evolve more and more fit and more and more interesting X. In our case, X happen to, happens to be robots. So um, in this particular run, even after more than 6,000 generations, um, we're still evolving interesting robots. You can see there's some very interesting ecological dynamics going on here. In the inset, you can see that there was this red species, which tended to dominate the population for a while. It had the most fit robots. Um, but even while these red dinosaurs, if you like, were around, these uh, little blue mammals showed up and although initially they didn't travel as fast as the red dinosaurs, after subsequent mutations they actually uh, had higher fitness and drove the red dinosaurs to extinction. Um, so we get a lot of these rich ecological dynamics and I want to talk a little bit about why this occurs. One important change that Nick made was to change the genotype. So the genotype now encodes two of these CPPNs, and again, just remember that a CPPN is painting a regular pattern across a substrate. What you're looking at here is a visualization of just one genotype. That genotype contains one CPPN which paints the body plan, so it paints the three-dimensional shape uh, of the robot in panel J there, and paints the voxels as being either active, red, or passive, light blue. The second CPPN paints a controller or, or a brain onto that robot. In this case, it's a very simple controller. Uh, it's outputting a, a frequency and a phase offset for each voxel. So we have a genotype which is specifying body and brain, but a mutation to CPPN, a, a mutation to CPPN1 will affect the morphology of the child, but not the controller. A mutation to CPPN2 will impact the controller in the child, but not the morphology. So we're dissociating the mutational impact 
of on morphology and control. That helps. It's necessary but not sufficient. One other change uh, that Nick made um, was in how selection occurs. Um, one way that this is normally done, and this was the control case in Nick's experiment, is again we're selecting for fitness on the vertical axis, but the horizontal axis is another selection pressure that we bring to bear on the population, which is the number of generations since injection into the population. So imagine we have this evolving population, and every once in a while we create a new random genotype and we inject it into the population. That genotype is very young. It probably produces a phenotype that uh, has a low fitness. So it's protected in this case by the fact that it's very young. So what you're looking at here is a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm where we're trying to select things that are fit and young. So for example, um, I don't know if I have my pointer here. Um, this green dot up in the upper left there has very high fitness, as you can see, but it is also quite old. We're taking one over age here. Um, so it survives. This robot out here has relatively low fitness, but it's much younger, so it survives. So anything, robots that are shown in red here are less fit and older than some other robot in the population. They would all, all the red dots would die out and the four survivors in this case would produce offspring. So this is how we get these, um, these sort of ecological dynamics of new species appearing and having time to evolve and increase in fitness before competing with the older species. The important change that Nick made in his experiment was how we compute age. So in Nick's work, he, for each robot, he measured the number of generations since the last morphological mutation. So we might have a child that has a different morphology than its parent. It suffered a morphological mutation. So in this case, it would have an age of zero. So this should probably be one over one plus generations. This robot has a morphological uh, mutation age of zero, so it's very young, and then it may produce children of its own that suffer uh, a control mutation. That child has a morphological mutation age of one. If it then produces another one that has a control mutation, it has an age of two, and so on. So in essence, what Nick has done is set up an evolutionary algorithm where when the body changes, that species has some time for control mutations to catch up, so to speak. This is a parameterless evolutionary algorithm. We don't actually measure how long we protect something until it uh, competes against other species. Just by introducing this change, we get this dramatic increase in evolvability over time. So you can think of this, if you like, as a form of development. There's no learning here. But we're making changes to the body and then allowing evolution to sort of retune the controller to that new body. And by doing that, we start to see new species over time that have very different bodies and controllers that start to catch up. So you can think of this as an organism where the child is born and it has longer legs than its parent. You want to make sure that there is some mechanism in the child that allows its uh, brain to adapt to the new body. I don't have time to go into it, but it's interesting that if you invert this process, it doesn't work. If you protect control mutations, so there's a change to the brain, and allow the body to try and catch up, it's just as bad, if not worse, than this. So this is interesting from a robotics point of view because it says there's something special about the body. And in particular, there's something special about morphological uh, evolutionary change to the body. By having longer legs, in some ways, there are many more opportunities for that robot or that organism than a ro an organism that's born that has the same, uh, the same legs as its parent, but there are changes to the, the brain. So again, this is sort of interesting from an embodied cognition uh, point of view. Okay, um, here's an example of this evolutionary run without this morphology protection idea. Again, let me walk you through this. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten rows here. Each row represents one evolutionary run. And 
Um, each column represents evolutionary time in generations. The color of each robot represents its fitness. So the warmer the color, the higher the fitness of that robot or the faster it travels. And you can see mostly cool colors here, meaning in all of these 10 runs, evolvability was low. We weren't able to evolve fast moving robots. If you take any given row, you'll notice that the shapes are more or less the same. So even though mutations can change body or brain in these cases, most changes to the body, that the controller doesn't work with that new body. And because that new body is not protected by evolution, it's rapidly killed off by other individuals in the population. So evolution is kind of stuck on a local optima with whichever body it's on, and it's sort of gradually trying to tune up the controller to that body, and it doesn't get very far. When we introduce this morphological protection idea, things look very different. You'll notice a lot more warm colors, so we're getting, again, much higher fitness over evolutionary time. If you look at any given row, you can see, uh, you can see quite uh, large changes in the body. So evolution is able to make these large jumps, uh, like Tony was mentioning, these sort of hopeful monsters, where there's a big change to the morphology, and subsequent control mutations, at least in some of these cases, eventually produce uh, a descendant robot that's more fit than other individuals in the, the population. In this particular situation where we're just evolving robots that travel over flat ground, it looks like there is one large global optimum, or at least one local optima, which seems to collect uh, all of these evolutionary runs, which is the shape shown in the very right-hand column here. So they're all sort of converging on the same shape. We've evolved these robots in other environments. They don't all converge on the same shape. Okay, so um, back to Devo now. I want to I want to finish today by talking about some work by uh, Francesco uh, Carucci, uh, who recently graduated from uh, Cecilia Alashi's uh, group here. Francesco sent, spent some time in my uh, lab last year working on a new Evo Devo mechanism. Um, again, Francesco was using uh, these CPPNs as the genotype. Again, this uh, CPPN was painting the three dimensional shape of the robot, but it was also painting inside each voxel uh, DS over DL, if you like, which is how that voxel's material property is going to change in response to the environment. So again, this is something that Tony mentioned. In real Evo Devo, Devo is responding to the environment, and Evo is tuning how Devo responds to the environment. So here we now have an evolutionary algorithm which is able to set how the material properties of a given voxel respond to the load that at the mechanical stress or the load that acts on that voxel. So if a particular voxel is painted with a positive value, that means that voxel will become more stiff the more load it experiences. If load decreases, that voxel will soften. If the CPPN paints a negative number onto a voxel, that means that that voxel will soften in response to increased load and stiffen in response to decreased load. So we are forcing these, we are building into the system which aspect of the phenotype responds to which environmental signal, but evolution is deciding how that interaction or that feedback loop occurs. So far, so good? Makes sense? So this is very different from Sam's work that I showed you at the beginning where we just had this ballistic developmental trajectory. It just unfolded the same way regardless of the environment. Now we have a robot where its phenotype is going to be different from one moment to the next, but it will also change when we place it in different environments. Okay, so I'm going to show you one of Francesco's evolved robots here. Um, so this is, again, we are evolving these robots for uh, locomotion, so moving away from the origin. The color now is going to represent material properties. So voxels that are painted with cool colors are relatively soft, and voxels that are uh, in warmer colors are stiffer. And as you'll notice, these voxels are stiffening and softening over time. <coughs> 
They reach this sort of plateau where nothing much is changing. This feedback loop has entered into some equilibrium state where it's sort of fixed its body plan. This is one evolved robot. And what uh, Francesco wanted to investigate was how robust are these phenotypes? What happens if you take this evolved robot out of its native environment and place it in a new environment? And you'll see that in a moment here. Francesco doubled the gravity. This is one of the nice things about simulation. So now uh, we've got our robot operating on a larger planet than Earth, if you like. Let me just back up so you can watch this transition again. When he doubles the gravity, the robot stops moving doesn't know that. But the material properties respond to this new environment, and this robot grows uh, an exoskeleton cage, if you like. Right? This robot never experienced that doubled gravity during the evolutionary process. It just happens to be robust to that novel environment. And again, as roboticists, this is something that's very important to us. If we design and test a robot in the lab and deploy it into the field, we want to make sure that the robot continues to do whatever it's supposed to do, even if the real world is slightly different than our lab conditions. So again, this is just anecdotal evidence. We haven't done a lot of analysis yet, but this is really kind of interesting, right? You have a robot that is not so much an animal, but a plant, right? It is radically changing its body as the environmental conditions change. In this case, it happened to change its developmental, it happened to change its phenotype appropriately when it encountered this environmental change. That might not always happen, but we want to investigate the conditions under which that happens. So um, Devo is helpful for roboticists for several reasons. The first reason, as I showed you in Sam's work, is it provides rich material for evolution to work on, and we can increase evolvability. It also is able to produce more robust machines for us, machines that um, continue to do what we want them to do in different uh, environments. So um, Francesco and I were talking about this, and this is really sort of the robot, exa uh, robot equivalent of Wolf's Law. So this is something that's been known in physiology for a long time. Um, bone growth is responsive to particular kinds of mechanical loads. So human infants, even if they knew how to walk, probably wouldn't be able to walk because the bones are just not strong enough in the ankles. But as they move around and hold on to mummy and daddy's legs and hold on to tables and chairs. They are putting particular load signatures on the bones and the ankles, and the ankle bones respond appropriately to stiffen in just the right way to support the infant's load and allow the infant to eventually walk. Right? So we have this physiological feedback between phenotype and the environment. There is an, uh, an equivalent law for soft material. So muscle, for example, responds well to intermittent uh, stresses. If there's too much stress, that's not a good thing. If there's too little stress, that's also not, not a good thing. Wolf's law and Davis's law. I put up here alongside it Hebbian plasticity. So this is brain feedback, or the brain responding to environmental feedback. If you know the robotics or the machine learning or AI literature, there are thousands of papers about Hebbian plasticity. How many robotics or AI papers have you seen that mention Wolf's Law or Davis's Law? I haven't seen any. I, I put that up here to sort of show there's, in many ways in the robotics community, this sort of blind spot where we tend to focus on neural control of our machines and assume that the body is fixed or we know how to design the body that's not the hard part. The hard part is the, the brain. And I think a lot of these evolutionary methods and Evo Devo methods are showing that there is a lot of untapped potential in the design, automated optimization and design, not just of the body, but or, uh, not just of the brain, but of the body uh, as well. Okay, so uh, I'll leave some time for, for questions. Um, everything above the line was sort of existing technology that we drew on. I already mentioned briefly uh, Hyperneat. Ken's going to talk about that uh, later, uh, which allows us, in our case at least, to evolve or paint regular patterns uh, in space. And what I showed you in Sam's work and Nick's work and Francesco's work is evolving regular patterns in time. Right? Evo Devo allows us, or allows Evo to create temporal dynamics that occur at different time scales, see where those different time scales synergize or antagonize, expand the amount of time in which they synergize, and shrink the amount of time in which they antagonize. And that's what increases the evolvability of these Evo Devo 
uh, runs. Um, I didn't have time to talk about some work we did a few years ago about another advantage of Evo Devo, which is that it often uh, turns the body into a scaffold. And uh, again, if you want to talk about that, I'm here. We can talk about that offline. Uh, I showed you Evolving Soft Robots, Nick uh, Cheney's work. I mentioned VoxCAD. You can go and download that and try that out uh, yourself. Um, and finally, I talked about uh, Nick Cheney's work on evolving morphology and control independently and how when we do this, it's an approximation of Devo, and it also shows us that there's something special about the body. It provides additional opportunities for evolution above what would happen if we just pre-assumed a body and tried to optimize uh, control. Um, there's a pointer to the code if you want to download this and try, try this out yourself. Uh, I think I'll leave things here, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.